welcome to Creative Piecemeal Podcast, a podcast for creatives. I'm your host, Tammy Takeishi. Join me for compelling conversations with artists, actors, authors, musicians, and other creatives about the impact of the creative and fine arts in their lives and our ever-changing world. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome to Creative Piecemeal. This is Tammy Takaishi. Today I am joined by a dynamic duo, Emily Golden and Rachel May of Golden May Editing. They nourish a fierce love of the story craft and a hunger to unearth the truths of why the story works the way it does. Their business, Golden May Editing, helps tenacious writers level up their stories and skills. If you're ready to invest in yourself and your story, contact them to start leveling up your skills today. And I'll have all of their information in the show notes. Welcome to the show, ladies. Thank Thank you. you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us. We're excited to be here. Excellent. So really excited. I've followed you guys on Twitter, but it's just a small world that we have some mutual friends in common. So so we're going to start with a pretty common question I'm sure you guys get. First, we'll have Rachel answer and then Emily. But who or what inspired you to become an author and editor? Growing up, my brother was always a huge reader and I wasn't. I did not really find stories that I loved until about middle grade. And I read a middle grade fantasy. And at that point, just my entire world, I feel like changed. I felt so drawn into the story and just I could picture the world. And what changed for me in that moment was that I wanted to make people feel that way. I wanted to make people feel the way I felt when I read that story the first time. So the remaining time of my high school, um, you know, growing up, I started to dabble in writing. I was like, oh, if I, if I can, if people can make me feel this way, I can do it. Let me try it out. And then I realized just how much I love working with story in general, whether it's writing or editing, just the whole process is one of my greatest loves. So coming out of high school, going into college, I just decided, you know what, if I could do this for a career, that would be amazing. Let's work with books all day. Let's read and edit and help people tell greater stories and teach them. That's how I got into it. And, you know, here we are and it's our careers and we're living our dreams. Fantastic. Yeah. So I, gosh, I've been writing since I can remember I was the kid who who was always writing picture books and coloring making my own drawings for my picture books um and then in first grade I actually submit to a contest my first grade teacher helped me submit a book to a contest but I'm pretty sure I was disqualified because it was essentially just my version of Little House on the Prairie (laughs) so um but she was she was very nice about it so yeah I've been writing I wrote all through middle school and high school. And then when I got into college, I stopped writing. Um, I got really into environmental activism and political stuff. And so I did that out of high school for a while. But then a few years ago, several, many, too many years ago, um, when things started to get a little bit crazy in the States, I turned to writing as sort of a way to process the world without having to directly think about it, if that makes sense. And then, you know, in that process, met Rachel and she was also writing, met some other writers and just realized how important stories are for the world. Like stories are what move us and change us and, and, you know, push us along. Yeah. So that's what inspired me and Rachel to start helping other people bring their, their messages and stories and voices into the world. Wonderful. And even though it's mentioned a little bit in the bio, would you like to tell listeners a little bit more about your business? So our our business, Golden May Editing, our goal is really to teach writers how to write good stories. So we want to help them level up their stories, level up their skills. Um, and through our coaching, we work with them one-on-one to do that, to teach them, take them from story idea, very fresh baby outline going all the way from beginning to end through revisions, kind of uh, have our hands on all different parts of the process. Um, we have a couple different resources as well, um, but everything that we do is geared towards teaching writers story craft, teaching them how to improve their stories, understand story better. Um, because exactly like what Emily said, we believe stories change the world and we believe everybody's stories matter. 
and we want help. We want to help writers tell their stories because they can change the world and they can make a real difference. Yeah. And I'll just add, yeah, we have the one-on-one programs that Rachel was talking about. We have outlining revision and drafting programs. We have our Tenacious Writer Society, which is a community of writers who are dedicated to leveling up their craft skills together um, with monthly master classes and a fun nerdy Slack group. And then we have our course from Story Idea to Cohesive Outline as well, which is a an online evergreen course that teaches a lot of most of the stuff that we that we work with our one-on-one clients on. So we have lots of different stuff out there. Nice. Are there like webinars for people who just want to pop in and learn one concept and not necessarily sign up for coaching or? It's a great question. I think we would both agree that's on the horizon. We're super excited to dip our toes into that space. On our socials, we do lives pretty frequently. So we are trying to, you know, we have lots of free resources out there for people to join in and talk with us and chat with us and learn more. Webinars are something we want to do in 2022. Wonderful. I'm curious. What is one of the biggest issues that people come to you when they say, I need your help? The concept of what a story is, is one of those things that humans recognize intuitively. Like we know what a good story is when we see it, right? But it's not something that we are innately able, I think, except in some really, you know, small circumstances, something that we are generally taught how to articulate or how to break down and be able to explain why a story works, right? So I think a lot of times the folks who come to us at the foundation of what they're trying to do is they have a message they want to share, they have characters that they care about, they have ideas for a plot, but how to put all of that together in an arc of a story that makes sense, I think is one of the biggest things that we teach. Um, We really walk people through like, what is an arc of change in human lives? And how does that translate to the shape of a story? The folks that work with us, I think that's probably the number one thing that they come to us not understanding and leave really have us all grasp of. It sounds like you really set writers up for so much success. So I I wish you the best in, in all the future endeavors too, in addition to everything that you guys have going on. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What is one of your favorite things about having your career and doing your editing and book coaching? I'm going to answer that with a two, a two parter. <laughs> um, so I'm a, I'm a new mom. So on the personal end, like I just love how I have so much freedom with the work that we do to be present with my daughter and we are able to work from home. So we have so much flexibility. So that's, you know, a huge convenience and a huge benefit. Um, on the other end, from a client side of things, my favorite thing working with clients is just brainstorming with them and seeing things just start to click. We do weekly phone calls with our clients and we ask our clients to do weekly assignments. And then we give feedback and we chat and we discuss and we brainstorm and we solve problems. And this whole ideation process of working through a story, solving issues, putting things together, creating that shape that Emily was talking about. That's my favorite part. So when I see When I see things click for writers and when I see their skills improve and brainstorm with them, it's all my favorite. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And brainstorming can be so much fun because you can start with idea A and then suddenly it becomes completely different. Exactly. Yes. It's almost magical to see that transformation, right? It totally is. And because I, you know, one of the big benefits of working in a one-on-one coach in a one-on-one coaching relationship is that you really build off one another. So a writer, you know, I might present an idea that writer takes it to the next level. Then I provide like another spin and then they go to a whole nother level. And it just is such a wonderful back and forth dialogue. And two brains put together on a story are usually better than one. We believe that it's impossible to write a great book alone. And so when you work with someone who can help elevate your story, like you get some really like golden stuff that comes out of that. Some awesome, awesome ideas. Excellent. And Emily? I totally agree with everything that Rachel said. The flexibility is amazing. I love the relationships on the one-on-one. I think my favorite part is watching my clients' skills improve so exponentially. Like once things start to click and then their writing just skyrockets in terms of, you know, its quality and how they're getting the emotion across on the page. I just love like getting that nugget in my inbox the next week and just seeing how much further they've taken it. It's just so exciting to me. Wonderful. And on the idea of writing advice and helping people, what is a piece of writing advice that you ignore and one that you follow? And we'll start with Emily. 
I think my two pieces of advice that I always give people are like, follow your gut, listen to your instinct. Like if you think that something is right, even if you're not quite sure why you're probably on the right track. And if you think it's not working, then there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that gut feeling. And then always ask why, why is this character doing this thing? Why are you putting something in the story? Why is something happening? Like I'm always asking why, why is the character making a choice? And that's as a coach, that's primarily what I do is ask why over and over and over (laughs) again. Um, And so I think it's a, it's a helpful tool if, um, you know, writers get stuck. And then the, the piece of, I don't know if this is writing advice, but the thing that bothers me the most is when people try to claim that writing is a thing like writing well is a skill that you either just like have in your genetics. You're just, it's a thing you can do or it's not. I just hate how that implies that it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're either a genius or you're not. Um, And I think that that is a, a piece of advice that gets thrown out a lot in workshops and from primarily older authors who, you know, feel a little bit protective about their industry and stuff. And I think that that's where that's coming from, but I've seen so many people believe it. And it's just not true. We are storytellers. Humans are storytellers. And like, you can write a good book if you want to, if you're tenacious enough. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tenacity really has a lot to do with it and perseverance and just getting your tush in the chair. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How about yourself, Rachel? I completely agree with everything that Emily just said, especially like asking why. I think my my writers who have gotten to that space where they are in that mindset of asking why as they're drafting, just that's where their skills really start to take off. But I think my favorite piece of writing advice, um, and I talk about this a lot on social media, is this idea that as you're drafting or as you're doing any piece of your writing practice, only stop when you know what's coming next. And I think a, a lot of writers will write in, until they're kind of petered out and then they have words left and then they're like, okay, that was an awesome writing session. Let me, let me stop. But then the next day when they come to the page, they're just out. Like they don't ha- have any ideas left. They've used them all up. And not that having these intense writing sessions are bad, but that you should always kind of stop while you're ahead because it allows you to, to come to the page with the next day with ideas and inspiration and the trajectory that you want to go down that transformed my personal writing life. That's how I was able to finish a couple drafts um, and really get some solid work done is this idea of just stopping when I know and when I have a good idea. And if I'm not sure what next, just push until I get there. And then the piece of writing advice that I typically ignore is that you have to write every day. That doesn't work for me. After I've had my pregnancy, was uh, I was exhausted. And then having a new baby, you're exhausted. I felt so much writing guilt of not writing every day. And then it like compounded the longer that I was to write every day. And so I've done a lot of work in the last couple of months of just letting that go and trying to find like writing practice that's sustainable for me, that works for me. And then the advice of don't stop until you know what's happening next. I've been able to make some real progress. So I think a lot of people, it doesn't fit their schedule. And um, I hate to see writers feel like failure because they're not able to write every day. I would agree. I mean, I used to be at a point where I could write every day, just, just given what I was doing in my schedule. And then I got busier and I don't write every day. And that's okay. Because when you're not writing, you're soaking in ideas from living your life, you know, from being with family, from talking about books with friends on coffee dates and things like that. So it, it may not be direct writing, but it certainly influences writing. Absolutely. I think Emily and I talk a lot about all of the different things that writing is. Writing is not just typing words on your computer. Writing is the whole gamut of researching and thinking and creative and discussing and drinking your coffee and absorbing the world. Like there's a lot of creativity out there to absorb and to funnel into practice. Definitely. And I think it really makes for richer storytelling when you, when you get out of your bubble and, and you embrace life and bring that to your work. I completely agree with you. So this one's always a tough question. Who are some of your favorite authors? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, I'm looking at my bookshelf right next to me. I think my one of my favorite authors that was really formative to who I was growing up was Tamara Pierce, Tammy Pierce, um, Quartet. All of hers are just amazing. Um, so she's one of my favorites. You know, the Hunger Games trilogy is a classic. 
I just recently reread it and was like, oh, this is so great. Tamara Pierce is the first one that comes to mind for me. Um, So right now I'm really enjoying V. Schwab. I love her. And she goes by Victoria Schwab for her middle grade. Her middle grade is so good. Uh, I've been reading it with my cousin, but I love her adult stuff. She just has the best like gray characters and really interesting character development. So I'm really into her for that. Sabah Tahir's recent series. Uh, yeah, her books are just um, so masterfully plotted. And um, I read a lot of um, Tasha Suri and Fonda Lee, who are both um, adult epic fantasy writers. Yeah, just reading some really good stuff lately. And digging a little deeper into that, if you could be any fictional character, who would you be? Um, so I've been thinking about this. And I think I would choose Kate Daniels from the um, Kate Daniel series by Alona Andrews, which coincidentally is my favorite book series that I did forgot about talking with your previous question. But Kate is like a really strong, just um, character who begins completely shut off from everyone else in the world, bitter and like slowly transforms. And she does she doesn't turn away from her power. And at the same time, embraces it as she grows throughout the story. And by the end of the story, um, she becomes a mother. And so that's really been very close to me in recent years. Um, and I've enjoyed it's a It's a kick-ass story. Like, it's a really awesome urban fantasy. So I highly recommend it. Kate Daniels. Two of my favorite female characters lately have been Shay from Jade City and Shalom from Brandon Sanderson's Way of Kings. I don't know if I would want to be either of them because they have pretty, pretty crazy stories. I don't know if I'd actually want to go through their, their lives, but I do really enjoy them. Definitely there are characters that are fun to live through on the page, but you wouldn't really want to live through. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. If you could do any other creative arts besides what you guys are currently engaged in, what would that be and why? I would love to act more. I used to act a lot sort of in between my writing phases of life, which I think is one of the reasons I didn't write quite as much in high school and early college was because I was, I was acting and acting takes up a lot of time, but it still takes up a lot of time. And now I'm an adult human with jobs and things like that. And it's just hard to fit plays, you know, into life because of how time intensive they are and taking you out of the house. But I do really, I would love to do more of it. Nice. How about yourself, Rachel? Um, I would love to be a musician. I play piano and I took violin lessons and I play music. So has always been a really huge part of my life. So um, I would have loved to specifically a concert pianist but yeah I love the piano so much and I have um an upright right now and I'm play it for my daughter and I and she loves to smack the keys and I can't wait until I can actually teach her something like of substance (laughs) oh that's cute yeah and speaking of music if we could sneak a peek at your music collections what are some things we'd find and do they influence your work That's a good question. Well, lately, just for fun pump up music, I've been listening to, uh, or while I'm working, I've been listening to a lot of uh, the new Taylor Swift stuff, the new Adele stuff, and the new Ed Sheeran, I won't lie. I'm loving all of their new albums. It seems like there's a lot of great albums coming out this fall, so uh, I can't complain about it. When I'm writing and editing, I can't have, I can't have singing in it. It needs to just be instrumental. So I have a lot of like random Spotify playlists that I play when I'm working on anything that involves, you know, actually writing or critiquing writing. Nice. And Rachel? I, I'm the same way with writing. So any, I really love anime soundtracks when I'm writing, but as far as just music taste in general, I feel like I could go anywhere from 80s rock. I have a ton of 80s rock that I just love listening to. Grew up with that. My husband is super into hip hop. So I'm like very close with that. And I feel like I just go all over the place. I love EDM too. So I feel like I listen to a lot of things. Um, But right now, my favorite song, if this helps at all, I don't know if you'll (laughs) know it. It's called uh, May Day by the Fat Rat. That's an EDM song. And I really enjoy that. Rachel's super hip, and we're all going to have to go Google that now. Oh my gosh, please do. It's wonderful. It's called May Day featuring Laura Brown by the Fat Rat. You'll enjoy it. There you go. Definitely unforgettable when they have names like Fat Rat. I know, yeah. (laughs) 
I like to listen to those playlists on YouTube where you can just like start a song that you like and then it will auto fill like anything that's similar. So I have a lot of those going on. Nice. Very eclectic. Yes. On both <laughs> ends for you guys. Uh, not on mine. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you fill in the blanks of like what I don't listen to. I have like maybe one. I don't even I just listen to that kind of pop music during the day because it's like upbeat and it's I don't have to think too hard about it. Hey, I've got nothing against some T Swift. Pretty good. A bit of a left turn here. How has your life in the creative arts been different than you imagined? I think that probably depends on at which point I'm imagining it. I think as a kid, (laughs) as a kid, I wanted to be a writer, but I don't know that I ever really believed that I could be. When I graduated high school, I thought I was going to double major in theater in college. And then I did not like my college's theater department. Um, And so that didn't happen. I sort of just went full into the activism, environmentalism, the social justice side of things, um, which was a great space to be at that point in my life. It's still a great space to be. Um, And so at that point, I didn't really see writing or editing in my career at all. I thought I was just going to go down that path, but I burned out really hard in that sphere. It's a, it's a very draining sphere to be in. Um, But I think, you know, the work is super important. So still involved in the ways that it can be, but yeah, I didn't see it coming really until it was happening. If I'm honest. (laughs) And Rachel, how about you? So I started school in pre-med. I wanted to be a doctor. Very quickly, I realized that I maybe wanted like that I had a love of reading books and I had like maybe a aspirational dream of like, maybe it would be cool to be a doctor. And so when I thought of like tangibly, like, what do I love doing that is more than anything else? It was reading books. And so I switched to being English literature major and like focus on actually video games and and learning and development. I never pictured myself being freelance. I never really kind of wanted that. I don't know. It's, it sometimes is uneasy because you have to work for yourself. You have to find your clients. You have to, you know, do all of this work in order to build a client base. And I kind of pictured myself working for a publishing house and I thought maybe I would do that, but I didn't want to move away from Phoenix, which is where I live. And so there's not many giant publishing houses in Phoenix. So I kind of put that dream on hold for a while and I worked in a couple of tech startups and really loved it. And I love the whole environment of being hands-on with the work that you're doing, being super involved in decision-making. And finally, I realized like, wow, I guess I do want to have my own business. And I guess I do want to build something from scratch that changes the world and makes a difference. So then around that time, Emily and I met and, you know, here we are, and I'm doing exactly what I feared to do years and years ago when I switched to become um, an English literature major and really pursue like reading and writing. I'm, I was the same way as Emily, where I don't know if I ever believed that I'd be able to write full-time. And now I'm able to write and read full-time doing both. (laughs) So uh, it's kind of like the the best of both worlds for me. And I didn't ever picture it ending here or or leading to this spot, definitely not ending, uh, but (laughs) but leading us uh, to the place we're in right now. And we have so much growth on the horizon and just like unlimited possibilities of what we can do and where we can go next and how we can serve other authors. And it's really exciting. Wonderful. Yeah. I think sometimes the best careers are the ones that surprise us. Yes. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think you have to be, you know, willing to fall into that and also willing to take risks. Um, It's being in a creative job, I think is scary. Um, It takes a lot. (laughs) It's very vulnerable. vulnerable thing I think a person can do. Yeah. Yeah. And so it, it takes a lot to do this. Um, and I would encourage any other person who's considering it, lean into that vulnerability. Um, it's so fulfilling. It's difficult. It's scary, but you can do it. It really, I think it's changed our lives just in many, many ways, but for so much good. Excellent. What is one common stereotype that you guys ho- hope to break with your work as editors and book coaches? I don't know if this is a stereotype, but I do think there's this belief that to be a successful author, you need to be chosen and that only the, you know, lucky few get chosen and therefore it's not worth it to try to tell your story and put it out in the world. Writing a book is a really, really hard thing to do. You're not going to be good at it the first time you try. And I think a lot of people think that if it doesn't come out perfectly, 
if they don't know exactly how to tell a story at the beginning, then they're not going to be one of those lucky few. And it's just not true. And especially, you know, we live in a world in which we get to decide when and how we want to publish and who we want to reach. And we don't have to be chosen by the gatekeepers if we want to get our stories out in the world. And so I think, yeah, I think I would just want to break that belief that it's this, this thing that's unattainable because it's not. I completely agree. So I'll just, I'll build off that. I think that there is a, a, a belief that if you aren't a published author with the, you know, a six figure contract and three books lined up and a book and a TV deal on the way and Netflix has optioned you and your life is made that you're not successful. I think writers need to evaluate what success means for them and like what it looks like and where it fits on their journey. For us, I think the writer that tells the story that they envisioned and and are able to communicate the message that they want readers to learn from, that's success. So if you're if you're writing that book, you are succeeding. You're on the right path. Like Emily said, just don't don't listen to the the belief out there that you have to be anything except for telling the story that you dream about. Very true. What is something that you wish you had known when you first started your business? So with the business and with my writing, I'm a very, I'm a perfectionist. I'm a control person. (laughs) So I like to know how things are going to turn out when I start. I like to know if I'm ready for it. And I think when it comes to anything in the arts or in entrepreneurship or anything like that, You just have to start before you're ready because you're never going to be ready. You just have to dive in. And so I wish that I had had that sort of mindset and permission when I was starting both things, like, like you're good. You can go for it. Like there's no time to waste. Great. And Rachel? Yeah, I 100% am in line with that. I, I think that it's like we talked about earlier, scary to do hard work. It's scary to be vulnerable and go for it. If you're considering any type of creative career, if you're considering learning how to write a book, if you're considering becoming a musician, creativity matters and it's valuable. Regardless of if you can monetize it, it's valuable to your life, to others' lives. And so I wish that I, when we started, I put, I was less fearful of that. Um, and a little bit more vulnerable and ready to just, I also feel like a very risk averse person. So I've learned like to um, break outside of those barriers and be conscious of that. Wonderful. And that leads so beautifully into our final question, which is in your own words, what does it mean to lead a creative life? I love this question. For me, I think living a creative life means that vulnerability piece, being vulnerable, sharing, whether it's with your close friends or with others, or or maybe not sharing it at all, but putting yourself out there and doing what fulfills you, I think is a creative life. I also, I think back to growing up, my mom had a painting easel and she would always say that she was going to paint. She painted once and then looked at it and said, I'm not creative and then kind of put it away. And I wish I could go back to her and to me at that moment and being like, you are creative. Like you don't, no one needs to tell you that you're creative. Like you are, go be creative, like do it. You're not doing creativity for anyone but yourself. Fail, learn, be bad, become good. Like whatever, whatever that looks like, just don't be afraid to try. Everybody's creative. Like I, nobody is not creative. I don't, people say that I think because they're scared. So if you've ever said to yourself, I'm just, I'm not creative. You are just figure out what that means and then go do it. Humans are creative. It's part of, it's in our DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think for me leading a creative life, and I, I know that this probably isn't how other people would describe it, but for me, it's about knowing myself. There's so much about myself that I have learned by creating characters and exploring themes and asking questions about how I see the world and how I want to see the world and how I want the world to operate and just like putting myself in other people's shoes. There's just something about the openness of being willing to look deep into yourself and look deep into others because art is about human connection. It's about figuring out how to connect with another person at a, at a soul and a heart level and move them. And I think there's a certain, for me, the best part of the journey has been getting to know myself better. Wonderful, beautiful sentiments and things to remember. Excellent. Well, ladies, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Listeners, please check out the show notes to engage with Rachel and Emily of Golden May Editing and seek out their advice, 
and all of their really fun stuff on their websites to help take your writing to the next level. Thanks and have a great day. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Like the show? Have a question? Stop by the Facebook and Instagram pages. Links are in the show notes or search for a creative piecemeal podcast on social media and click follow for all the latest.